So welcome again to the Mitigation Planning Coffee Break Series. Today's uh, topic is Performing Natural Hazard Risk Assessments, and your presenter is Amanda Syok. We also have on our panel Brett Holt and Matt Williams, who will be introduced and, um, and presenting a little bit later. Amanda, take it away. Great. Thanks, Becca. Well, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Syok, and I'm a mitigation planner here with FEMA Region 10. Um, I am newer to this position. Um, I switched into this position back in November. Um, I was a risk analyst uh, for the region for a number of years before that, uh, so performing risk assessments was kind of my job. So um, I am I'm more than prepared to give this talk today. And uh, with me on the phone, I'm um, presenting uh, in just a little bit will be Matt Williams with Dogami, which is the uh, Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. So we will go ahead and uh, proceed. So Becca, if you can go to the next slide. Thanks. So there are just a couple of objectives for today's presentation. Um, at the end of the webinar today, you should be able to have a better understanding of risk assessment terminology. You should be able to recognize hazards and community assets and be able to determine potential losses to uh, vulnerable community assets. So we'll go ahead and jump right in to the next slide. Thank you. So uh, mitigation, for those of you that are newer to the concept, is the reduction or elimination of a long-term risk to human life and property from hazards. So um, this graphic is showing that while mitigation uh, does uh, have a role in preparedness, it also has a role uh, throughout the emergency management life cycle uh, during both the uh, recovery, um, both short-term and long-term uh, phases. So uh, we'll go ahead on to the next slide, Becca. So uh, mitigation increases resiliency is the, the key concept of this slide. And uh, what that, uh, is looking at here on this graphic is there's both mitigation planning and mitigation actions. And mitigation planning educates the public and increases understanding of risks and capabilities and helps build partnerships within a community. Whereas the mitigation action piece uh, reduces impacts of hazards and reduces losses to prevent future vulnerabilities. So today we're really focusing on the understand risk and capabilities uh, concepts and how that supports planning and leads to action. And uh, I hope that you can um, see by the end of the presentation, I hope that you fully understand that um, uh, with less damage, there is uh, a faster recovery time and therefore the community is more resilient. Let's go ahead on to the next slide. And that is what is a risk assessment? So high level, it's a process that collects information and assigns values and risks, um, but it should be used to identify and compare different courses of action. It can develop priorities within a community for where, uh, what are the, the top priorities to mitigate or to reduce risk to, and it can inform decision making. So I've got a um, just a quick little graphic I wanted to run through. Um, so with U.S. car makers, um, there, we did not used to have seatbelts in our cars, and so if you did not have a seatbelt and you got in a wreck, you could be thrown out of the vehicle, and this would be very expensive, uh, whether in car and medical repairs. So uh, auto industry decided to start installing seatbelts, and with that, there was a small cost associated with that, but it resulted in um, a number of savings uh, to the general public and to first responders. So um, this graphic can also demonstrate that um, in general, uh, for every dollar spent on mitigation measures, there's $4 saved um, to the taxpayer. So let's go ahead to the next slide. So FEMA does require risk assessments as part of the hazard mitigation plan. Uh, the guidance can be found in the local mitigation plan review guide online. And uh, I wanted to do a quick run through of what these requirements are. So per FEMA regulations, our uh, requirements, uh, the four key things are, one, a description of the type, location, and extent of all natural hazards in the planning area. 
I do want to highlight that that is all natural hazards. Um, uh, you know, you if the community decides to leave them out, they have to be explicitly stated why. The second bullet is information on previous occurrences and the probability of future events for each jurisdiction. You can see that each is capitalized there um, because when we see county plans, we often see um, that the county has done a good job of listing previous occurrences, um, but the individual jurisdictions don't. So uh, if you're doing a multi-jurisdictional plan, there needs to be uh, uh, this information for each participating jurisdiction. The next bullet, oh, if you go back a slide, please, like that. Um, so the next bullet says a description of each identified hazard's impact for each jurisdiction. So again, each is emphasized here, but um, each community in the plan needs to have the description of their hazard and impact. And then finally, there's a summary of vulnerability for each jurisdiction. So again, multi-jurisdictional planning must have the vulnerability, the hazards and impacts for each participating jurisdiction. So we can go ahead to the next slide. So there are four main steps to assessing risk. One is to describe hazards. Two is to identify community assets. Three is to analyze risks. And four is to summarize vulnerability. Uh, the re rest of this presentation is going to be going through how to do these four steps. Um, and I did want to call out that um, if you are involved in a plan update, um, consider uh, the changes in hazards uh, for your hazards piece. Um, so whether there's been disaster declarations, um, whether there's been um, you know, new knowledge of, of hazards. I know um, Spokane area of Washington, a new fault line was identified. So that might be something to put in to an update of a hazard mitigation plan that there's new hazard information available. Um, and then changes in community assets is important during a plan update as well. So considering how population has changed and, uh, you know, how that increases or decreases vulnerability. So I do have a poll that I would like to pull up for this slide. And uh, that is uh, to ask you, what do you think the purpose of uh, FEMA conducting a risk assessment is? Um, so. Becca, are we able to get that pulled up? It's coming. Okay. All right, so um, the, when the poll does come up, you'll see um, three different answer choices of why you think um, FEMA requires risk assessment. Um, is it because of the Code of Federal Regulations? Is it because we want you to understand your vulnerabilities, or is it so you can reduce your losses? I'll give you all a minute or two to, to submit that. And you'll see I also have um, a graphic on the, or an image on the side of the slide for the really big one, the New Yorker article that came out uh, back in July of 2015. And this article used the risk assessments developed uh, by FEMA for the Cascadia subduction zone uh, to uh, discuss what the potential impacts were to the communities and to I uh, kind of get into the politics of preparing for this and, and what those next steps were. So, um, you know, risk assessments are, are can be really valuable communication tools. So we've got just um, a few seconds left on this poll, I think. And uh, we had a lot of people put uh, B, it looks like, for their answer, so you can understand your vulnerabilities. And while that is a component to the risk assessment, the, the correct answer here was actually C, so you can reduce your risks. Um, the point of FEMA requiring risk assessments is so that you can understand your vulnerabilities to inform your decision making. Um, so uh, you can reduce your risks within your community. So it was kind of a trick question and it looks like I fooled lots of you. So I hope you're paying attention now and you're awake. All right, we can go ahead uh, to the next slide. So the first uh, piece here that we, the first step in conducting a risk assessment is your hazard description. So on the FEMA review tool, that's elements B1 and B2. 
and uh, it requires the location of the, of the hazard, which would be the geographic area. It requires the extent, which would be the strength or magnitude. It also includes previous occurrences, uh, including extent and impact of those occurrences, and then probability of future events. So I've got an image here uh, that has, uh, that shows the state of California and the San Andreas Fault. Um, you can see the quote above from the summer movie, San Andreas, where they say, you will feel it on the East Coast, and well, you will not feel a San Andreas earthquake on the East Coast, at least not the shaking, maybe you'll feel some social vulnerability impacts or something, um, you won't feel the earthquake. Um, but I wanted to point out that this map uh, meets um, multiple of the elements um, required for a risk assessment. So this map shows the uh, location of the fault line. It shows the, the um, extent of where the, the earthquake can, can be felt. And it also shows probability. So you'll see um, there's that little table on the bottom left and it shows the, um, the scale rather, sorry. Um, and that shows a 30 year likelihood of a magnitude 6.7 earthquake or greater. So this map is really accomplishing multiple things here by showing the probability of an earthquake happening as well as the location of where it can happen and as well as the potential strength. So that's just one example of um, a way to describe the hazard. So we can go on to the next slide back up. And this is uh, another hazard map of the same area, um, but this map focuses more on um, describing the history. Um, so you can see there, there's still the San Andreas fault line that's labeled there, but then there are um, circles representing where there were past earthquakes, as well as the rectangles, which are, you know, um, so it's paleoseismic sites, which, you know, are much, much earlier, the historical type quakes. But just this, pick, this map does a really great job of documenting the highly, uh, the high seismic activity within this area. So um, this map could meet that requirement for showing past occurrences. So well, these past two examples are uh, both maps showing um, how to describe the hazard. Uh, you don't have to use the map for this piece. If you don't have GIS capabilities, um, a hazard narrative is fully acceptable uh, to meet the FEMA uh, requirements. This is an example from the Marion County, Oregon Hazard Mitigation Plan. And here they are describing landslides. And uh, they describe here um, the location, which is the west facing slopes of the Salem Hills. Uh, they describe the extent, so, you know, five miles east of this creek and along the slopes of this river. Um, they, they also describe um, this other area, the Waldo Hill. And then for uh, the, uh, the extent or the size, they say the landslides are one of the most widespread and damaging natural hazards in Oregon. So this narrative um, does a very nice job of explaining where the hazard is um, as well as uh, the extent of this hazard. So we can go ahead into the next slide. Um, so I did want to talk briefly about climate change. Um, we've seen well, uh, we've seen many hazard mitigation plans come in with climate change addressed, and um, we've seen different uh, different ways of looking at climate change. But I think the best way we've seen is where climate change isn't looked at as a hazard of itself in and of itself. So it's not treated separately like a flood or an earthquake, rather it's treated as an influencer to existing hazards. So um, what that means is it looks at how, um, you know, the existing hazards can be impacted or how the intensity can be influenced. Um, I also wanted to address that um, climate adaptation strategies uh, can complement hazard mitigation strategies. So we've seen kind of an uptick in communities developing separate climate adaptation plans. And while that, you know, there's nothing wrong with that, um, I think you could be creative and link these plans together and consolidate it all into just a hazard mitigation plan where you're addressing climate adaptation and climate mitigation strategies in the hazard mitigation plan itself. Um, 
So we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, I have a good example here of Jefferson County, Washington, and how uh, they looked at climate change in their plan. So they went through and looked at observed changes as well as future projections. Um, and this is kind of the, the hazard description, if you will. Um, and they talked about how um, you know, they are expecting to see increased uh, precipitation, um, shifts in the timing and type. Um, they're looking at a diminishing snowpack lowering, summer river flows and extending drought seasons. Um, extended warm temperatures can result in increased river water temperatures that can impact wildfire risk um, through decreased soil moisture as well as stressed forests. Um, they also look at increasingly corrosive uh, ocean waters. So all of these elements that are called out here were then uh, discussed in more detail in the individual hazard description uh, section uh, of their plan. So Jefferson County did a, a really nice job um, at integrating this. So we can go ahead onto the next slide, and uh, that is looking at different sources of hazard information to uh, describe the hazards in your geographic area. So um, the first step, you, you, the first place you should look is your state hazard mitigation plan. So the state uh, goes through and identifies the hazards statewide. And if you're not sure which hazards impact you, this is certainly a good place to look. Um, I have, uh, if you're looking for uh, pre historical disaster information, I've got the site SHELDIS here, um, and that stands for Spatial Hazard Events and Losses Database. And that's produced by the University of South Carolina, and it includes uh, hazard loss data dating back from 1960 um, for 18 different types of natural hazards. Um, there is some free information from the site. It used to all be free. It looks like now there is uh, a fee for some information. Um, but you can always reach out to your state hazard mitigation officer to, to find um, if they have the, the data already. Um, let's see, other sources of hazard information include looking at state agencies. Um, so the State Department of Natural Re Resources, uh, State Land Use or Emergency Management, they often have um, their own hazard assessments that they've funded, whether that's on landslides or wildfires um, or even uh, earthquake. Um, a lot of state agencies also have their own uh, GIS viewers. So, um, so it's a web-based um, that you can go to um, to look at available hazard layers within the state, and often you can download from that. I've also got on here hazard-related reports or plans. So if you're um, at the jurisdictional level, you know, if you're in, in emergency management, you might want to reach out to your natural resources department and see if they've done a floodplain management plan, for instance, or, you know, perhaps there's um, a vegetation plan within the city looking at land cover and, you know, soil types and forest health. Other, uh, other places for hazard information are federal agencies. So um, the USGS is the uh, geologic survey, and uh, they are the federal agency tasked with developing uh, shake maps, which are uh, maps that depict earthquake magnitude. So that's what the picture is on the right here. Um, and you can download these from the USGS's site, and I will be uh, sending out a, a, um, a handout at the end of this presentation that has links for all of these. Um, but USGS develops the shake maps that show shaking intensity uh, for various scenarios as well as events. Uh, FEMA is the federal agency for developing flood maps, and you can uh, download those from the FEMA Map Service Center. And then on NOAA's website, it has a plethora of information. They have weather data. Um, they had climate change data on there. Um, it should still be there. Um, and then they also have tsunami mapping um, on their site as well. And then just also consider the, the people that are on your planning team. Um, you know, if you've got somebody that's been in the city for a number of years, they probably have some historical information, um, you know, as well as real life experience. And then um, the local records, such as newspapers, local historical societies, often have really good pictures showing impacts of hazards locally. 
So uh, we'll go ahead on to the next slide and um, I'll open up another poll. Um, all of the, the data that I talked about so far is kind of in GIS based. And I'm curious how many of you actually use GIS um, or have GIS on your computer um, or if you have GIS staff that you can rely on. Um, a lot of the uh, components of a strong risk assessment is having GIS data that includes uh, building footprints and building values, um, types and construction, plan development areas, uh, future development, um, as well as, um, you know, documenting past events. So, um, you know, I'm just curious uh, if you're in an emergency management department and you don't have GIS, uh, you should you should get to know your GIS staff because they can make this process so much easier for you. Um, and I guess I also want to point out here that um, if you don't, um, uh oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I guess I just also want to point out here um, if you don't have a lot of GIS data. Um, and you are contracting out your hazard mitigation plan, um, if HAZARDS is offered, you, you don't need it. Um, and I'll get into this in a little bit, but um, HAZARDS is really expensive. If you don't have GIS, then um, the data isn't really meaningful to you. Um, but it looks like, based on uh, the people uh, calling in right now, that um, a large number of you actually do have GIS and know how to use it. So it's really great to see. Um, I hope that, uh, you know, if you're doing a risk assessment that you consider looking at these different types of data. Um, assessor's data uh, especially is helpful to show um, what potential losses could be um, if that building is damaged or, um, it, or lost. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, uh, which is moving into the second phase of the risk assessment process, and that's identifying community assets. So um, now that we've identified where the hazards are, the next step is to look at what is at risk to them. So things to consider include critical infrastructure, essential facilities, um, and we've got this list here. Um, but we're gonna dive into a little bit deeper here um, what those things are. So let's go on to the next slide, and that's looking at critical infrastructure and essential facilities. Um, I didn't realize that I had a, a gift there. Um, I thought it was just a picture, so surprise. Um, anyways, uh, this is an example from the, uh, which community is this? Um, from the Sam Point, um, Idaho plan. Um, and anyways, uh, this was, uh, it's Bonner County, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Becca. Um, and what they did here is they, mapped out the community area as well as their essential facilities. So they've looked at police stations, fire stations, schools, and medical care facilities. And it looks like they used um, the HZIP Gold data set to do this. Um, this is a data set um, that's at the federal level. Uh, you have to request access to this from FEMA. Um, but uh, it's a federal data set. So, I'd say if you are a local jurisdiction and you have GIS data, your data will likely be better than what's coming out of this HZIP gold. Um, however, if you have minimal GIS data or are just starting to get your uh, GIS department up and running, HZIP gold can be really helpful. So uh, let's go ahead uh, on to the next slide, and that's looking at uh, historical significance. So infrastructure that has historical significance to the community. So um, while it might not, it won't affect, uh, the, the loss of this data won't affect response, but it can certainly affect the community's resilience and the sense of place that um, a community feels. Uh, this is an example from the Seattle, um, the Seattle Hazard Mitigation Plan. And the purple dots are all uh, designated historic landmark structures, um, most of which were constructed prior to building codes. So as the community is looking at potential mitigation projects, seeing these areas that are all built prior to code 
um, this could make them a higher priority uh, to bring them up to code to make them safer. Um, this also helps, that also helps with recovery goals as well. Um, just looking at, you know, are these buildings going to take longer to, to rebuild post-disaster? And will that affect, um, you know, the, the community's overall well-being by having those destroyed? If that's what defines an area, having the historical nature um, destroyed, then that can really uh, impact morale in the community. So we'll go ahead on to the next slide. And that's looking at uh, cultural significance. Um, the tribes do a really great job of identifying cultural significance within their hazard mitigation plans. And I think a lot of communities, um, non-tribal communities, can, could benefit from, from learning from this. But um, this is from the Suquamish tribe hazard mitigation plan um, in Washington state. And they identified at a high scale um, things like archeological sites, sacred sites, culturally sensitive areas, uh, petroglyphs, and gathering areas. Um, and they did it from a high scale because they don't want these sites to, to be publicized. But they do acknowledge that they are here um, and that where their general location is and, you know, that they want to prioritize these areas for, um, for mitigation. And they, they want, um, you know, they, they want these places to, uh, to last. So, you know, it's, um, when thinking about long-term recovery, uh, they see these areas as being valuable in the future as well. So we'll go ahead on to the next slide, and that's natural resources. Um, in case you didn't notice, I've had a lot of slides in here from Jurassic Park. Um, I ran out of time looking at, for examples, but uh, natural resources in your plan are important. You want to think about maybe your water supply or maybe you have a big tourism population that um, uses some of your natural resources. And, um, you know, thinking about how these resources can both be an asset to your community and how they can impact your vulnerability is very important. Uh, we can go ahead on to the next slide. Um, and that's just looking at population and economic drivers. So when you're thinking about community assets and capabilities, now think about the difference in your daytime versus your nighttime population. Um, you know, some commuter communities have, you know, very little daytime population, but the nighttime population is much larger. Whereas, um, you know, a lot of urban areas, their daytime population increases drastically. Um, think about your tourist season um, and how that can, you know, if there's a, a catastrophic earthquake during high tourist season versus low tourist season, um, your response will look a lot different. And then thinking about other things like uh, non-native English speakers, um, you know, and the differences in income that, that uh, areas of your community face and how that can impact their ability to recover from a disaster. So go ahead on to the next slide, and that is step three, analyzing risk. So uh, we've now identified uh, where hazards are, what is vulnerable to them. So now we're looking at what actually happens to it during an event. Um, this is part of element B3, FEMA's, uh, for, uh, FEMA's regulations. And the requirements are to evaluate vulnerable assets and to estimate potential impacts and losses. And this has to be done for each hazard for each community. Um, so we can uh, go ahead on to the next slide. Um, this is an example from Nome, Alaska, um, how they looked at their risk assessment. So they ranked um, their hazards based on magnitude. Um, so they've got catastrophic, critical, limited, and negligible, looking at um, facilities that are either shut down, what injuries um, are looking like, um, and what percentage of that property is damaged. And they looked at um, different, uh, different types of infrastructure to, to, fit, um, to develop that uh, criteria, or to develop that ranking, rather. So they looked at coastal highways and roads. They looked at water and septic systems. They looked at the damage to bridges. Um, so I think this is a part where um, a lot of risk assessments start to fall apart. They do a really great job of identifying here's the hazard. Um, and here's our, here's our 
infrastructure, but actually looking at what the potential impacts to that infrastructure could be and what that means to a community. Um, so uh, Gnome did a pretty good job here, and I did want to point out that they didn't use a map. They didn't just list the values of infrastructure because that isn't helpful. Um, the, uh, and this, this plan referenced historical events in order to paint this picture of what it means, um, what this would look like so to have damaged power distribution systems or to coastal roads. They referenced historical events. Um, so that's just a, another, uh, another way to approach this. Um, this plan's actual uh, impact portion was rather weak, but their reference of so many historical events and the, the damages that resulted and what, you know, how that impacted their response um, made up for those weaknesses. So let's go on to the next slide. Um, you know, what we've talked about so far has been quite data heavy. And I do want to say that um, FEMA's risk map program, which stands for Mapping, Assessment, and Planning, can do this analysis for you for free, I would add. Um, so, uh, the RISMAP program is, uh, in Region 10 anyways, is managed uh, by the state RISMAP coordinator in each state. Um, their names and email addresses are here, um, but they're in charge of telling FEMA where the RISMAP program should be uh, deployed. And so that's looking at where we should go and do risk assessments for communities. Um, and the point of RISMAP is to help communities assess their risks um, and to help them mitigate. And it's a multi-year process, um, but if you're interested, I highly suggest you reach out to your state risk map coordinator um, to, to learn more about what could be provided and how that can help you in your hazard mitigation plan update. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, so if FEMA does do risk assessments uh, through the risk map program, we use HAZIS, which stands um, which used to stand for Hazard US, and I think it's just morphed into a word at this point. Um, but Hazard is available for earthquake, flood, and tsunami, and it is a free loss estimation software that is GIS based. Uh, however, it is highly data intensive. Um, we'll have Matt get into this a little bit more in a minute, um, but this is just an example. Um, so this map here shows Aberdeen, Washington, and it's looking at building damages um, Five percent. So it's essentially it's taken flood information, uh, paired that with assessors' data, and run a model of what a hundred-year or one percent annual chance flood uh, would look like in this community, and what types of damages would be expected. So the red dots are the 75 to 100 percent damage. So that does highlight, you know, where mitigation strategies. Um, should be prioritized is where those red areas are. Um, but to get to this, um, a lot of GIS data is required. Um, that does, um, I've got down here just some of the things that we look at, and I think this might actually be for earthquake, um, but, you know, leveraging information from your assessor's data, including building contents, building cost, the occupancy type, um, the building type, so looking at, is that a wood frame building? Is it, um, is it cement? Um, looking at year built to see if it's pre-code or post-code. Looking at the number of stories. For flood, we really look at foundation type. Um, and then design level, so what was that building actually designed to? So, um, you know, if you are interested in having this information, certainly reach out. Uh, to your state risk map coordinator and you tell them that you want risk map. Um, a lot of contractors will advertise that they will run hazards for you, but they'll use just federal data sets, so your results aren't going to be very accurate. And if you don't know how to use GIS, um, you know, a lot of this data won't be very helpful because you won't be able to use it afterwards. So that is my my two cents on hazards, and um, I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to Matt Williams to talk about um, how Jokami uses Hazus, um, and they have really high quality data sets and do a really good job. Um, so take it away, Matt. Thank you, Amanda. Um, 
Well, okay. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Matt Williams, and uh, I'm a ge uh, geohazards analyst for the Oregon Department of Geology and Mineral Industries. Um, unfortunately, I don't have any Jurassic Park uh, themed slides, so I feel like I kind of dropped the ball there, but uh, we'll, we'll try to make do. Um, so for the past couple of years, uh, FEMA has uh, funded us to conduct uh, multi-hazard risk assessments for the state of Oregon. Um, Amanda asked me briefly to go over some of these different types of analysis that we do. So um, I'm going to discuss four of those, um, starting off with Hazus. So Hazus, uh, she kind of briefly went over it. Um, again, it's uh, data heavy. It's, um, it's loaded up with uh, many economic models, damage functions, and demographic data. It's, um, it's actually what it is. It's a, uh, it's a software extension to ArcGIS, but it's a very robust uh, extension. Um, uh, it's, um, so uh, the way that Dogami uses it is that we don't, um, we, don't, we don't use a lot of what Hazus can do because Hazus out of the box does, has a lot of functionalities that are only accessible uh, when you're using the general building stock, which is the d default um, data set, building data set that um, is aggregated on a census block level. So um, we have very good building data. So we want to kind of leverage uh, Hazus's functionality to get uh, finer detailed uh, results uh, from our um, building data. Um, the way that we do that is there's a function in, um, well, there's an option in Hazus called um, user-defined facilities. Um, so we enter in our building data points into that, um, that part of Hazus. And um, the buildings are, are um, attributed with, with uh, assessor data. So there's some important um, attributes, such as occupancy type, um, that we have embedded into the UDFs. Um, the occupancy type is key because the the damage functions. Uh, the, these are basically tables that are in uh, that have um, damage curves in them, and each occupancy type has a different damage curve associated with it. So a um, mobile home occupancy type will have a different damage curve than a residential one will. So um, once you have that loaded in and you run the analysis with our um, depth grid, um, let me go back. The depth grid is actually uh, very important because it, it, um, it, each pixel in the depth grid is associated with a depth of flooding. Um, whenever the point is intersected with the pixel, um, that goes to the damage function. And the more, basically what it is, is the, the deeper the flood, the more damage that's going to occur for there. So on this map, you can see we have different, we have a different uh, points that are symbolized. Um, uh, the cursor is going to the red ones there and the green ones. So um, the reason these are all kind of in the floodplain, you'll see the, uh, these points in the floodplain, um, but they have different uh, levels of damage to each of them. The reason why this is is because also with our UDFs, we have uh, attributes such as if it has a basement or not, um, or the first floor height. So those things determine the levels of damage. For example, if the first floor height is above the level of flooding, then it's not going to have any damage associated with it. Okay, so I think we can, oh, one, one more thing before we move on to earthquake is that, um, I, and I shall skip this actually, I should go back. Um, so the problem with how is this out of the box, it's, it's kind of a black box. So you don't really, you can, you can put in your depth grid and hit all the right buttons and get results, but it's hard to really judge what the results are. Are those good results or those bad results? It's hard to tell because it's, you just hit the buttons and then you get something. Um, so the reason why I feel like 
the UDF is a much better way of doing it is because you can um, fine tune your data that you're putting into Hazus. Hazus is is very good whenever you have very good uh, hazard data and very good UDF data. You can get great results. Um, an important part of that process is to, to uh, it's iterative. So you run it, you check your results, you see if there's any problems, like maybe I need to adjust a first floor height or something, and then you run it again. And after several times running it, you can feel a lot more confident in your results. Okay, so let's go on to Earthquake. Earthquake is, um, it works kind of in the same way that um, Flood does, except for it's much more complicated. There's a lot more parameters involved. There's yeah, instead of one um, hazard layer, there's eight. If you're doing a if you're doing a certain type of analysis, um, there's also different. Uh, there's a many many more um, damage tables uh, because it's not just occupancy type. It's building type is the main one, but there's also the the design level and then a couple other things that really expands that those damage curves. So it's a, it's a much more complicated process. Um, the um, the out of the box earthquake uses um, census track level results. So your your results will be census track based. Um, we like to have much. We have very good data, so we want to get more fine grain. So that's why we don't use the out of the box uh, method for that. Um, the two kind of prime ways to run an earthquake analysis is probabilistic and deterministic. Probabilistic is going back to that, if you remember that slide that uh, had Paul Giamatti on it, that Amanda showed, it had that map of uh, the San Andreas Fault. That is a probabilistic um, layer for earthquake, um, which is good, but, we also, but if you have a specific scenario that you want to look at, you would use the deterministic. And in Western Oregon, um, pretty much from Central Oregon all the way west to the coast, the determining, um, the biggest concern is the um, Cascadia subduction zone earthquake. So that's, that's pretty much all the analysis that we've done so far has been using that scenario, which is a deterministic method. Um, let's see. Uh, skipping ahead. Um, we also look at, I didn't mention this before, but we also look at um, population, impacts to population. Um, so there are, um, there are um, formulas that are associated with calculating how many people are going to be impacted by uh, the earthquake, for example. Um, and before we move on to the next slide, I just want to point out on the map, you'll see that I have a liquefaction symbolized here, which is one of the um, ground failure parameters. Um, and you'll see that there's a, a patch of red in, in the damage, uh, in the, da the symbolized damaged. Uh, the red areas, those are actually mobile homes. Mobile homes surprisingly don't uh, perform very well. <laughs> in an earthquake, so that's why you see that there. And that's why it's important to have a uh, very good um, UDF attributes um, so you can tease out that kind of uh, information. Okay, next slide, please. Um, okay, so historical analysis, that's something that I don't necessarily work with a lot. Um, maybe not directly, indirectly I do um, be, because um, historical analysis is kind of the, ba for example, it's a basis for a lot of the hazardous damage functions um, because they have the economic impacts are based on real world events that happened that get put into the model. So we know how a mobile home performs in an earthquake because they've looked at past events and they know that mobile homes don't do very well in an earthquake. So that's how that works. Um, but uh, this, I would say the strength of historical analysis is that it, provi it provides an, an actual real-world example um, that can be transferred to a theoretical model. And 
Um, that's how I use it personally. I, I also feel like, just side note, I don't um, do this kind of work, but um, a lot of you on the on this uh, line do, and I would say that historical analysis is very, it's a very impactful way to communicate risk because people can see, uh, for example, the high water marks. Like um, that's, you can actually see, oh, the water came up to this uh, level on this telephone pole. This is how deep the water is going to be. That has a very strong um, impact on, on whenever you're whenever you're discussing with uh, with folks. Um, so I have on on one of my bullet points the Vernonia example. Um, one of the, this was before my time, but um, Dogami uh, after after the 2007 flood in Vernonia. It was a very, it was um, it was over a hundred year flood uh, from what I read, and uh, we went there and um, brought a comparison map. So we we brought the we we mapped the two, 2007 elevation and also a hundred year elevation, and, and we we're, were able to bring that to the community and show them like, okay, this is what you know, this is what we're dealing with um, for you, and and what you might. Um, think about for mitigating against because you obviously know that this is uh, something that can happen. Um, so just briefly, uh, a couple other examples: landslides. Um, you can use uh, landslides that that have happened in a community. Say this is this is the same type of landslide that is possible to occur over here. So you you might be aware of of that and. Um, address it. Uh, for as far as um, analysis goes, uh, the um, earthquake, the past earthquake and tsunami, well, Tohoku exact, uh, in um, Japan a few years back, um, that is going to be, a, that's a similar kind of earth, earthquake that we're expecting the CSZ to be. So that gives us uh, kind of a real world example for um, what we need to be thinking about when we're when we're doing analysis for earthquake. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, exposure analysis. This is one that we also use quite a bit because uh, Hazus. We only really use Hazus for flood and earthquake, even though there is uh, a brand new tsunami um, Hazus model out there. We haven't. We're still testing it, so we don't really we don't use it yet, but we will in the future. But for right now, we use. Um, Exposure analysis. Um, exposure analysis essentially is just determining if an asset like a building or infrastructure, like a bridge or an individual, like Paul Giamatti, uh, if it's within or uh, outside a given hazard zone. Um, so if uh, so, the way that we report uh, an exposure in an exposure analysis is that we just take everything that's within the hazard zone and we add up the value. For example, if there's five buildings worth a million dollars in a high hazard zone, then we report out that five million dollars is exposed to a certain hazard. Um, the advantage of exposure analysis is it it um, there's lots. There's easy GIS tools that are. They're very simple to run. Um, you just basically do an overlay with your assets and the hazard, and then you get some results back. It's it's very quick. It's very easy. Um, yeah, it doesn't require a lot of skill to do, but it can give you a very quick idea about the level of risk for for given area. Um, but you have to be careful about. Uh, Using the word damage when you're discussing exposure, because damage is, is um, more associated with has has us because it's giving you a percentage of damage, a, a loss ratio, whereas exposure analysis is just giving you're just giving the full value amount that's exposed. This can be misleading. It can give you a false sense of risk because the results are going to be very, very much higher than then the hazardous results are going to be, because the hazardous results, again, are just a percentage, as, whereas these are full, full value amounts. Um, okay, well, in, this exam, in the image on the slide, this is landslide risk, and you can see that basically we just have the, the building points are just symbolized 
with whatever zone they happen to be in. So, and I mean, that's, it's as simple as that. Um, okay, so next slide, please. Okay, scenario analysis. Um, scenario analysis is, is uh, I think, highly effective because you can get a, um, well, let me define it first. Uh, scenario analysis is uh, breaking up the hazard into different, what we call recurrence intervals. So the best example for that is flood. So instead of just having one flood layer, like the 100-year flood, for example, we'll have the 10-year, the 50-year, the, the, the 100 and the 500-year flood events. This gives us a range of, of possibilities. It gives you a, a spectrum of risk, and I think it communicates um, an overall uh, level of risk that's much more clear than, than other types of analysis. Um, it, uh, it's, it's a good way to compare events, so you can look at the 10-year event and compare it to the 100-year event. Um, maybe you're in an area where the 10-year the is actually very close to the 100-year, then you probably have a big problem, whereas uh, if the 10-year is much, much lower than the 100-year, then maybe you should focus your efforts on, on just the 100-year. Um, that's just off the top of my head, sorry. I just, I, I think it's, I think you get the idea. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, another another type of scenario that we do is is uh, tsunami. So we have we have and, and this is the image that you see here is the tsunami hazard. So the tsunami, uh, the small tsunami, is the lightest purple color, and as the tsunami mo as the, as the tsunami intro, uh, recurrence intervals are higher, then you get a larger event that happens. So at the far at the top of the image, you'll see the the uh, double X uh, large event, and um, and this is also a, an example of a of a exposure analysis. So the the uh, the, the building points are, are colorized based on what um, what event it is associated with. And oh, and before we go, one more, I, real quick, before we go to this slide, uh, this is that's actually Amanda's slide. Um, uh, I do want to real quickly just go over, kind of uh, briefly summarize the different pros and cons of each of these analysis. Um, I thought of this uh, earlier today, so um, I didn't put a slide for this. But uh, pros and cons for HAZIS, I would say, is um, you get really good results. Um, the con is it takes a lot of work and a lot of data to get those great results. Um, historical analysis pros, I would say it's, a real, it's taken a real world event, it has high impact, in communication, but the con is it's situational. It's you're only going to have historical events in certain spots, and in a lot of times not in in others. Uh, exposure, the the pros are it's quick, it's easy. Um, the cons are it might be inaccurate, it might give you a false sense of risk because you're getting very high numbers sometimes. Uh, scenario is it's comparative, it's it's broad, and it gives you a nice overall look at the, um, of, of the level of risk, um, of understanding the level of risk. Um, cons are, I don't really know. It's confusing. It also requires a lot of data, too, I guess. That, that would be it. Um, okay, that's all I got. All right, thank you very much, Matt. Um, that was really helpful, um, especially that pros and cons piece. Um, I think, uh, I, I liked also that you went into has a, a um, you know, you definitely got into the complexities of it, um, and you can get really good results if you have all that data to go into it. But if you don't really know how to use Hazus and you're not super comfortable with GIS, um, Hazus can just, it can, it can be a nightmare. So um, thank you very much, Matt, for for going into those. Um, I love that the tsunami piece is. Um, and T-shirt sizes, um, a little extra large tsunami. Um, that was good. Um, I know we are running a little short on time, um, so for those of you that need to drop off, go ahead. Um, we have just a handful of slides left that I will run through 
very quickly. Um, so if you can stick around, I'd appreciate it. Um, the slide that's up right now is a summary of uh, risk assessment results in Ada County, Idaho. And I, I just want to kind of summarize here, uh, you know, the, we've talked about identifying the hazards, we've talked about identifying your, your capabilities, um, step three was assessing the impacts, and step four is summarizing those results. And that first poll that we had at the beginning of this presentation was looking at, um, you know, why does FEMA require risk assessment? Well, we require it so that you can know uh, where you need to reduce your risk set. So um, when you're looking at contracting out your plan or developing your plan, um, a lot of times a big portion of that budget is spent on the risk assessment piece and the data heavy side. And I think Matt's uh, slides just gave you a good overview of the different levels of risk assessment you can do. And, um, you know, there, there is nothing wrong with doing just that exposure assessment and historical analysis that are less data heavy. Um, while they might give you a false a uh, sense of risk, um, they give you at least the areas that you would want to prioritize uh, regardless. So um, just be very cognizant of how much money you're spending on your risk assessment and whether or not it's worth it. So the slide that's up is um, just a quick table view um, looking at wildfire areas. And this was, um, it was an exposure assessment, but they, they linked in some probability here um, looking at the assessed building values, and then they compared that to the percent of damage. Um, so they must have used um, some modeling for that. Um, but you can then use this to say, well, if we spend, um, you know, a couple million dollars on uh, wildfire, public outreach, and defensible space, and fuels management, um, and fuels reduction, you know, that um, when you're looking at a cost benefit, it would definitely be more cost effective to spend some money up front rather to, than to spend $602 million um, on, on wildfire. So um, we can go ahead to the next slide. Um, another way that Ada County, um, so after they developed that table looking at risk, they then developed a list of issues for wildfire based on their risk assessment. Um, and they, they got into how wildfires can cause secondary ha hazards, um, being landslides. They addressed that climate change can impact this hazard, um, looking at future growth. Um, so they, they just went through a list of, um, you know, different things that they noticed from their risk assessment. So we can go on to the next slide. Um, and the next step here, so once you've developed, um, once you've consolidated your results, the next step is to, provide, is to develop problem statements. Uh, a lot of plans don't have this, and so we see that their risk assessment does not align with their mitigation strategy very well, um, and this is something that I would like to see fixed. Um, so looking at your problem statements, or, or developing a problem statement, you look at your risk assessment to identify that location of the problem, the, uh, the contributing factors to that problem, as well as the significance of the impacts. So um, if you wanna go to the next slide, Becca, um, the, uh, this example of problem statements here um, is from Newburgh City in Oregon, and uh, this is looking at wildfire. So here they say Newburgh City recently annexed Southwoods area uh, located in the, the Wildland Urban Interface, or the WUI. So they've, they've started their problem statement identifying the location of the problem. We'll go into the next slide. Um, so then they're looking at the cause that's creating the, that what is creating the problem, and that's that land use and building codes don't address wildfire hazards. Uh, so we'll go to the next, which is significance of impacts. Um, so because of this, there's an increased vulnerability to wildfires. And go ahead to the next. And so this is impacting future development. So based on this problem statement, uh, this can go directly into your mitigation strategy on what, what to do about it, um, which would be to look at building codes um, in the Wui area. So, um, you know, is wrapping this up now, um, you know, I hope that you have a better understanding of risk assessment terminology. Um, I hope you can see um, 
how to better identify and assess hazards and how to identify community assets and that you've learned some tools to assess those. Um, and then uh, we'll go ahead uh, to the next slide. Um, there's a poll that just opened up looking at um, you know, how you would rate this training. Um, we, we appreciate your input there. Um, here's a slide of resources. There's the local mitigation planning handbook, uh, which goes through the steps of how to do a risk assessment and has a lot of examples in there. Uh, you can access this webinar um, as well as previous webinars um, on the, the STAR website here. Um, there's some links to uh, some of the sites I mentioned today for hazard mitigation, or sorry, uh, for risk assessment data, and there's um, a PDF that um, will be sent out afterwards um, that has all these links as well. Uh, we can go to the next slide. Maybe we're waiting for that poll to finish. Um, so um, the, we do have another um, mitigation uh, planning coffee break um, from Region 10 next month um, in June. Uh, the topic there will be uh, wildfire, uh, community wildfire protection plans and integrating those with uh, hazard mitigation plans. Um, there's also, um, in July, we'll be talking about hazard mitigation strategies, which is kind of the next step after you've done your risk assessment. Um, all of our slides and recordings are up on that STAR website that you can reference. Um, let's go ahead on to the next slide. Um, FEMA does offer G318 trainings, which um, are the local mitigation planning courses. Um, we are hosting one in uh, the Dalles, Oregon, June 21st through 22nd. I think there's a few spaces left, so if you're interested, you can look into that. Um, we'll be hosting another one in Anchorage, September 21st and 22nd. Um, registration has not been opened yet, um, but if you're interested, uh, feel free to message myself or Brett, and we'll be sure to send you information for that. The course itself is free. Uh, you just have to pay for your travel. Um, Anchorage in Alaska in September is hit or miss. It could be beautiful and sunny, or it could be winter already. Um, and then October 24th and 25th, we'll be hosting one in Linwood, Washington, um, in our offices. Um, so we'll probably reduce travel costs for a lot of you. Um, so it's just a two-day uh, mitigation planning workshop. And then uh, we'll go on to the next slide. Um, this is just contact information for myself and Brett, uh, the FEMA Mitigation Planning Program Manager, as well as the State Hazard Mitigation Officer. Um, for each state. So, um, Brett, why don't I uh, toss it to you if there were any questions that uh, the group had? Uh, Becca, we, um, there were actually no questions specific right now, is just uh, asking about the slides and that we will get those out later. So, thank you. Great, well, um, I apologize for, for going over the time a little bit. Um, just a lot of information um, and my technical glitches didn't help. So I appreciate your patience and um, thanks for calling in. Becca, any uh, administrative things that you'd like? No, we'll be sending out an email after the class today with uh, a link to um, the, the website that you talked about earlier that has all of the previous webinars and a lot of other mitigation information. And we'll also send out um, a copy of the slides from today. Great, thanks. Thanks everyone.